Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's workshop, session number 147. My name is Xiao Feng Tao. I am a professor at Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications. I'm also the vice chair of the consultative committee on information technology, China Association for Science and Technology. I will chair today's workshop, Green and Digital Transitions Towards a Sustainable Future. UN's 2030 Agenda Goals 13 demands action against climate change. This requires significant shift towards green and digital energy systems. In today's session, we have six presentations. Our primary emphasis will be on addressing the important challenges and the governance aspects associated with green and digital transitions. First, I would like to invite our first speaker, Professor Gong, to give us the first presentation. Prof Professor Gong is the chair of the consultative committee on information technology of China Association for Science and Technology. His topic is on the three musts for accelerating the sustainable and the digital dual transformations. And let's welcome him. Thank you, thank you, Professor Hao. Uh, now I share my screen with all of you with my title is the three musts for accelerating the sustainable and digital dual transformations. Because uh, the, the theme of our workshop is green and digital transformation towards a sustainable future. I'm very uh, uh, pleased to be part of this workshop because it's really important. So talking about the dual transformation, my understanding is that these dual transitions are a historical process uh, which is crucial uh, uh, to the future of the humankind. Uh, this two transition, I think the goal is to uh, achieve the sustainable development of the humankind and the planet. That's a value pooling transition. And it is the, the, the digitalization, which is a, a very important tool for us to uh, achieve the sustainable development. So this transition I consider is a technique driven transition. So these two transitions are interacted with each other. They are not just the parallel two transitions. They are interactive. And the digitalization, very, very important tool for us to achieve the sustainability. So at first, I would like to talk about the urgency of the dual transformation, especially the urgency to rescue the sustainable development goals. So all of us know, eight years or seven and a half years, uh, uh, eight years ago, all uh, world leaders gathered together in New York has made a sustainable development agenda, which is called transforming our world. The 2030 agenda for sustainable uh, development. In this agenda, there are 17 sustainable development goals is defined jointly by the all member countries of the United Nations. And under these 17 goals, there are 169 targets. However, this year is the midpoint of the whole agenda. 2023 is exactly in the middle of the whole process. Last week, uh, uh, last month, the world leaders gathered together again in New York to <clears throat> review the progress of the sustainable development agenda. However, at this middle point of the 2030 agenda, the world leaders and the world people are shocked by the current progress. The latest the global level data and assessments paint a concerning picture. So this is the concerning picture. The green one shows 
those goals are on track or uh, the target mate. The yellow one is a fair progress, but acceleration needed. The red one shows the stagnation or recession of those uh, targets and goals. So this picture uh, shows us only half of them show moderate or severe. Uh, uh, not only half of them show uh, a moderate and severe deviations from the desired uh, <clears throat> trajectory. More than 30% of these targets have no progress or even worse, regression below the 2015 baseline, below than eight years ago. So this assessment underscores the urgent need for intensified actions to ensure the SDGs stay on course and progress towards a sustainable future at all. In short, the SDGs are need to be rescued. For example, just to have a look to the so goal one, no poverty in all its forms everywhere. So this figure shows you if we not uh, uh, come back on track, there will be five, 575 million people will stay uh, in, in extreme poverty by 2030. And here shows your current world vulnerable people, uh, vulnerable uh, population remain uncovered by social protection. For example, for children, only 8.5% received social protection. For the elder people, only 23% can receive the social protect uh, protection. That's why the report, the Global Sustainable Report, Development Report, GSDR, <clears throat> this report is every four years. And the newest report is titled, The Times of Crisis, The Times Change. So we have to realize the urgency of this uh, situation for sustainable development and take real actions to make changes. So that's the second point that I'd like to say. The second must is to take actions of using digital uh, technology to implement, to rescue the United Nations SDGs. Indeed, if we talk actions, I pay, uh, uh, people pay a lot of attention to the uh, digitalization. Let me uh, quote what uh, Secretary General Guterres said in the uh, UN summit uh, last month in New York. He emphasized the need to take actions in three key areas including addressing hunger, transitioning to renewable energy, and leveraging digital transformation opportunities. Further, please allow me to quote some words from the political declaration of the United Nations Sustainable Development Summit last month in New York. It, is, it states, we acknowledge that important lessons we were drawn from the COVID-19 pandemic in health, culture, education, science, technology, and innovation and digital transformation for sustain, sustainable development. It states, we will continue to take action to bridge the digital divides and spread the benefits of digitalization. We will expand participation of all countries in particular developing countries in the digital economy, including by enhancing their digital trend infrastructure connectivity, building their capacities and access to technological innovations through stronger partnerships and improving digital literacy. And it states, we will leverage digital technology to expand the foundations on which to strengthen social protection systems. We commit to building capacities for inclusive participation in the digital e economy 
and strong partnership to bring technological innovations to all countries. So digital transformation is, stre is stressed again and again in the political uh, summit last month in New York. That shows the importance of digitalization as a lever to achieve the sustainable development goals. So here, uh, I just show you some uh, uh, examples. For, for example, for the electrification, digitalization, digital technology, internet uh, things play a very important role to achieve uh, the, the uh, further electrification with renewable energies. That's uh, goal uh, seven. And for goal nine, industry innovation and infrastructure here I show you how uh, uh, digital big data uh, <clears throat> has been used uh, <clears throat> for uh, smart manufacturing. And here is an example of a, a city, famous city, Hangzhou in, in, in China, because Hangzhou uh, city, in, turn, uh, in, in the center of the Hangzhou city is a big, beautiful lake, we call it the West Lake. But that makes the traffic of this city very difficult. And this city was the top fourth uh, traffic jam city in China. But with the help of big data and the implementation of so-called uh, 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 city brain with, uh, empowered by artificial intelligence and uh, the, 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 uh, fourth, uh, the fifth generation of mobile communications, 5G, this city has now become the 27th uh, traffic jam uh, of China. So a smart city helps the uh, goal 11 and also for uh, uh, climate action. Here is another example used in China to use big data to uh, help to, to uh, mitigate, uh, to, to find out the leakage of the water pipes and to, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, help to, to design uh, the, the city uh, more resilient to the climate change. So ju just a few examples shows that how digital technology can help uh, uh, in different uh, sector, in different country, in different region uh, to help real actions to achieve sustainable development uh, goals. So finally, I would like to stress the importance of cooperation because the goal 17 is the partnership. So nobody can refuse uh, the importance of the partnership. But here I would like to stress the collaboration should in a interdisciplinary and intersectoral and international ways. So for example, uh, B, building information modeling. And, and the geospatial engineering is now widely used uh, in construction area. However, these technology are deeply rooted in different areas of engineering, such as internet, uh, information, uh, communication technology, satellite, construction, internet of things, and big data with applications in the management of resources and utilities. Telecommunications, urban and regional planning routing uh, of uh, vehicles, uh, parcel shipping, and so on and so forth. They hold great potential to the support of sustainable smart cities. So all these disciplines should work together with digital technology because digital without disciplinary border. And here I show you the China Association of Science and Technology in short cast is a platform for interdisciplinary uh, uh, collaboration uh, within China. We have natural science, industrial technology and engineering, medical science, technology and engineering, agricultural science, technology and engineering, and interdisciplinary uh, institutions. Totally, there are more than 200 uh, uh, disciplinary based institutions representing more than 40 million scientific, technological, engineering professionals. So this platform is idea for interdisciplinary collaboration, but also for international collaboration because we, are, uh, the, we have the consultative status to the United Nations. 
So we have close, uh, uh, worked closely together with IGF and we'll try to closer our collaboration. And another example is uh, the, the, uh, the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. Now I serve as the immediate past president. And this federation consists of more than 100 so-called national member organizations, such as CAST, the uh, Chinese member, member, uh, Chinese national member of this federation. So our federation is a uh, comprehensive engineering uh, professional uh, organization representing tens of millions of engineering professionals across the world. And we are keen on to collaborate with IGF in the near future more closely to uh, work with you all together uh, for celebrating the dual transformations towards a sustain sustainable future. My, uh, uh, I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Gong. Appreciate. Our second speaker is Professor Liu. Professor Liu is a director of Global Change Research Data Publishing and Repository. Professor Liu, also a professor of Institute of Geographic Science and Nature, and Nature Resources Research, Chinese Academy of Science. Her topic is about open science for green and digital transition. Professor Liu, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, <clears throat> And I'm glad to be here and share the information with you. I just like uh, Professor Gong said, so we are mid-time, mid-term of the SDGs, so we need to accelerate for the actions. So now so the challenging, uh, what the challenge is, so now we are mid-term uh, to the uh, 2030s, so less than half of SDGs in the world realize actually. So climate change, natural disaster, uh, oh, and the COVID, uh, and the all impact as disease, especially in the mountain area, uh, in the small islands, and the critical ecosystem regions. So this is uh, we, we, what we next step. So what is the ob objective next step? So the only one thing is accelerate to the SDG. We need to focus on the effort, and we need to work together for this target. So what's the solution? Definitely, they are, everybody has their uh, all uh, different uh, organizations has uh, different. Thank you. Sorry, that. So the solution uh, is the we need open science. The other science this uh, also. Oh, this is a challenge. I actually I already said, <laughs> and <laughs> objective is accelerated to the SDGs. A solution, the solution is open science, that I need and the, the, the technology also, but the science need a link to the technology, so big data and the Internet of Things, and the, and the link to the engineer. Not only science technology, but also engineer and working with the cases, and not only talk, but we need to start in the even a small village. So also we need to, together with the, the systematic uh, uh, management and then culture diversity. So this is the, this is the solution. And so we need to cooperate together, our partners. So in this idea, so we uh, in China, we action, uh, we start a new project we call the Geographical Indications, Environment and Sustainability. Short name is GIES. And this is a decadal program from uh, 2021 to 2030. So this is, uh, 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 we had it, if we do this, we need the infrastructure. So there was a background, so there, there is a, uh, World Data Center, we call Global Change Research Data Publishing and Repository, this World Data Center, and then open data, open knowledge, open the geographical site, let the people to visit this to understand what you are and what you are doing. And this, pro this infrastructure got a VCS prize in the, 19, uh, in the 2018. 
So and then technology, uh, we need the, the, the need the link to the big data and the Internet of Things and then make this uh, how the product is traceable. So we give the identifiers and the DOI and the, and the digital object identifiers and the science technology uh, 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 identifiers and the global change data and the world data center uh, IDs and also have a trademark. Uh, give you the, and the trademark and then the quick response system and the people can uh, very quick to find where the, 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 your product come from. And then uh, when well, GIS, we take the network, the, the, that's the internet. We internet in the internet wireless and the wireless. And then, then we have this, uh, uh, and, sorry. Uh, then the data, data publisher articles and the uh, uh, products uh, and then even local, uh, uh, local uh, observation stations and also the package uh, for the product packages, all linked together. So this is a network uh, in uh, everything together so you can trace uh, where, the data, where the product come from, uh, what the quality of the uh, product. So in China now we have, uh, there are last two years, we have 17 cases in whole different regions of China. So this is, uh, uh, there, are, there are many uh, different kinds of things. So, uh, so rice, uh, maize, uh, and uh, uh, bird art, uh, and, and uh, yeah, apple, and uh, many, many different agriculture uh, products uh, at the high quality also. So the benefit, one the benefit, so right now more, uh, at more than uh, 600,000 local people get, uh, farmers get the benefit. They got the income, more income, and then Customers, uh, for, for, for example, maize is one of the customers. We are happy if we got a, a high quality product. So we, because we have some little money, a bit more money to buy that, but we, do, we, we have less an idea which one is good. But from this project, we can identify which one is a good one. I, it's wider for me to buy that, to spend money. Many people like me go that. And also contributors got benefit. Many uh, is a scientist and the government officers got the credit. And then uh, we have how to organize this kind. So we have different partners. Uh, so for we have the uh, scientific committee and the uh, program committee and the uh, uh, company uh, uh, programs and, the, and the we work together. And then the key player, this is the Geography Society of China and the Institute of Geography of Sciences and Natural Resources in Chinese Academy of Sciences. And then uh, in the very beginning, we have uh, uh, four, 40 partners to join this program uh, two years ago. But now we have 101 partners organizations to join this and they are very, very happy. So now, and uh, this is, uh, uh, work is and got uh, greeted from FAO. And IPO uh, started in the new program as a one country, one priority product uh, in, in the world. And then we work in the IPO, uh, it was this, and then uh, uh, yeah, just a uh, uh, few uh, in, in Bangladesh uh, and, uh, and so, uh, uh, several countries in Asia Pacific, we start this program and uh, very, very, very welcome by, uh, by different countries. So also we also support, support not only developing countries but also uh, industry countries. We work with the United U uh, in the uh, uh, European uh, Union in the geographical indications cooperation. There uh, we China has agreement. So we have uh, ZBG, exhibitions and the change the products uh, in the, from European. There are good uh, good uh, wine and China has good tea. So they are change this when uh, they. Both of us need to what the data is, what the quality is, where it come from, how about the culture, how about the socioeconomic development, and how make it the sustainable development. So the both information can open and then. So the summary, the GIS is the innovative methodology is the keyword is open science and the multi-stakeholder engagement. But the open science is not only science, but the link to the uh, to the uh, original geo uh, geolocation and its environment, and the link to the product value chain, and the open science methodology, and the technology, and the engineering, management, and the geographical culture. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, and thank you for your presentation.
The third speaker is Ms. Tomoko Doko, the President and CEO of Nature and Science Consulting Limited Company. Her topic is on wildlife management in Japan for a sustainable future. Ms. Doko, please. Um, thank you, Chairman, for introduction. Um, Okay, uh, my name is Tomoko Doko, and uh, I have a PhD degree, but uh, I also, I got a hunting license in Japan after that, and uh, today I'd like to talk about something about wildlife management in Japan for sustainable future. Okay, let's talk about the general background of Japan and wildlife. Um, as you can see in the picture on the right side, Japan's main island consists of four primary islands, Hokkaido, Honshu, Kyushu, and Shikoku. And there are 97 terrestrial mammals in Japan, including 38 endemic species. Endemic species means the species only exist in Japan. Like the picture in the left side, the center one is uh, Japanese salo. That is one example of endemic species in Japan. Um, the, let's talk about wildlife management, why we have to focus today. Uh, because wildlife management is a management process influencing interactions among the, and between wildlife, its habitat, and the people to achieve predefined impacts. It attempts to balance the needs of wildlife with the needs of people using the best available science. Here I introduce the most important Japanese law related to this issue. The official name of the law is uh, Wildlife Protection Control and Hunting Management Act. This act conducts programs to implement for protecting and controlling wildlife and manages hunting in addition to protecting and controlling wildlife by preventing the risks related to the use of hunting equipment. There are three main components related to this act. The first one is control of population. That is the main purpose of today's topic related to that we need reinforcing uh, capturing. Second component is management of habitat of wildlife. The third one and the last one is countermeasures of damage prevention. Today, I introduce two species of uh, Japanese mammals. One is shikadia and wild, another one is wild boar. Those two mammals make troubles in Japan. And what kind of troubles is, uh, for example, in the crop damage. Another example is the forest area damage. Both shikadia and wild boar make significant damage in two domains. This is uh, just an example of the picture how the shikadia make damage to cropland or forest. The geographic distribution of two species become a critical problem in Japan. As you can see in this graphic from two, uh, from uh, 1978, both species tended to have expanded their geographic distribution. Therefore, Japanese government uh, decided to change the law. So revision of the law uh, was done in 2015, and new goal was set up. The background why we need to do that uh, is uh, negative impact of ecosystem and crop damage by shikadia and wild boar has become more severe and we can't ignore anymore. And the people who can do population control of shikadia and wild boar has become reduced due to hunters' population decreases or aging. Therefore, new system of certification of wildlife capture program so that the government can reinforce more capturing and grow up next generation of hunters uh, is implemented. And Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries did set up a new goal that is, by year of 2023, the government of Japan aims to reduce the population of shikadia and wild boar to their half of the one in the year of 2011. This is the structure of the act, and uh, 
uh, due to the time constraints, I focus on the second component, what is control of capturing wildlife. As you can see in the illustration, shikadia and wild boar are designated as wildlife species for control capture program. Uh, very briefly, I introduce uh, what countermeasures uh, we should do. Either we do gun shooting or trap hunting. For the trap, uh, as you can see in the picture ABC, uh, there are three types. Um, okay. And uh, for example, for the wild boar's case in picture A, um, you um, wild boar walk without noticing the location of the trap and then uh, the leg can be uh, captured by wire. The second one B is there is a box and uh, we uh, use a bait to attract uh, wild boar or shikadia and uh, when they touch the bait, uh, the trap box will be closed. And the uh, third one is a uh, large scale box type trap. Um, the picture in C is a kind of a small one, but it could be much larger, like 10 or 15 shikadia or wild boar could be inside. Okay. Then um, for the digital transitions, and green transitions, uh, there are some ICT systems and technologies uh, were proposed and implemented in Japan. These are the examples. Basically, there are three uh, main technologies using, for example, uh, drones are used to monitor habitats or are used for sensing technologies. And uh, remotely monitor the system, like uh, in the forest, for example, well, deer and wild boar are passing in front of the sensor system, then they can report to the user directly through the wireless network. And also, the last one is, for example, the system to count numbers or identify animal types. So they can differentiate the shikadia or wild boar or how many wild boar are there. Then for this case, they can choose the timing when to cross the door of trap by this kind of ICT technologies. Um, this is for the current situation and the future. So far, we are doing good. The population of two species tend to be decreased, but uh, we have data until 2019, so we don't know right now. We should continue to reinforce capturing. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations, thanks. Our first speaker is Mr. Kramers from Codata, Germany. His topic is on digital twins in action, complexity management, including process models and uh, workflow standards. Mr. Kramers, you have the floor, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Dear colleagues, uh, best greetings from our uh, early morning uh, Berlin time, Germany. And uh, I'm very sorry not to have the opportunity to be with you in Kyoto because it's so fantastic city in, uh, in, in, in uh, Japan. Uh, um, I have been there, uh, there myself and uh, I hope you enjoy the time also uh, besides uh, IGF conference in the city. My topic today is on uh, digital twins in action, our complexity management, including process models and workflow standards. There are some words in that title that I personally hope that uh, even in the sum up of in the discussion, we may find opportunity uh, because there is a little bit of deficit what we are doing um, in the last years and what we need to do next years when the complexity of what we handle becomes even uh, much larger than uh, we ever thought before. I'm working um, in, uh, um, in the sustainable development goals, in resilience topics, in disaster uh, prevention and disaster information management, urban information systems. And, um, and in that combination, um, there are, uh, my background is in, uh, in, in uh, disasters and, and uh, hazards. That is what, what can happen 
to our environment and, and to our fellow citizens. Uh, we have uh, to try to do our best uh, to, to be better in, uh, in, in, in many things as that uh, introductory presentation by Professor Kegong uh, very convincingly uh, stated, uh, we, we need to support our society at large. So in all these things, I don't want to go into details. You can download my slides, my slides uh, in a download link I give in the last uh, page. Um, so, but nevertheless, all these can happen, and it happens if you if you uh, remind your newspapers. Uh, then you see that uh, our um, life is uh, not very easy because have, we have to deal with all these things. There are certain facets for com uh, dealing with complexity issues, of certain facets of urban resilience, where we start not only from collecting data and see what we can do with the data, but we have to, uh, have to do a strategic approach, see the whole problem, and then look into the details, how they fit together. We start from a holistic approach to information management for intelligent cities, and smart cities, what we call it, which is characterized by societal demands, current problems and challenges in technology, financing, and so on, more advanced requirements of urban infrastructures, uh, advanced requirements that we, we, we have been working in urban infrastructure since minimum uh, 30 years uh, in, in 3D. Uh, that is when uh, 30 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, we started with uh, 3D urban models. And uh, of course, that is uh, now very much advanced in technology and gives also the, the, uh, much more problems in um, information management. There is technology behind that, laser scans uh, becoming better and more sophisticated uh, day by day. Then from the, from the uh, topics of uh, safety and security, uh, we have internal security, uh, which is the security of citizens in the city and the disaster prevention. That is uh, uh, what happens uh, regularly. Uh, we cannot avoid the disaster, but we can uh, better prepare our citizens to, uh, to have not so many uh, deaths and uh, also uh, not so, so uh, many uh, big uh, loss of um, uh, damaged uh, infrastructure and so on. Ecological and climate perspective, social, sociological issues in the city and fractionalized production and supply chains. This is one of the major things which is, is, makes a city uh, being live, active. Uh, with the perspective that is that everything can happen, but it is not just facts. You see, not just static facts, but it also deals with what happens. So, and what has to be done. Other facets of urban resilience is growth, agglomeration, and what I have. You have you see the problems of the uh, real big uh, cities, which uh, in other parts, not only in in uh, Europe here, but uh, much larger cities are in other countries uh, in our world. And uh, there are uh, development problems, there are ecosystem um, uh, problems where we have um, to deal with, with uh, health and, and uh, uh, things in, um, uh, for our citizens in the city. And uh, what, what I want to, uh, to take uh, um, your um, attention to is urban ecosystem services. That is uh, the uh, sustainable development uh, principles of not only seeing what is the ecosystems, but what does the ecosystem do for our um, uh, citizens? Make life enjoyable and have service for uh, uh, urban development and, and so on. So this uh, new topic which came up uh, two or three years ago only, uh, very sophisticated systems of ecosystem services. I come back to, to these things also when I, when I touch the uh, aspect of processes. 
uh, without with, uh, without taking too much time to to read, uh, I, I, the last the last point is intelligent transport systems. That is where actually at the moment there is here in Europe, also in Germany, very much um, uh, uh, work done in uh, transport, railways, transport, air transport, and so on. Uh, and uh, much money and uh, development put in intelligent transport systems with a lot of details, sensor systems all over, and uh, that is a real uh, stream, streams, multiple streams of information coming uh, just in time. We have the notion we come from, from uh, 3D urban models of different stages of uh, granularity, now to the term of urban digital twins. Now, digital twins this is not about robotics, but it's a, a, about of uh, having different, more sophisticated re uh, digital representation of what we call the urban sphere. Um, that there are certain principles to start uh, from the beginning. It's a uh, common good. There is a value behind that. We have to deal with uh, quality, adaptability, adaptability, openness, security and privacy, curation, standards, and uh, in totally have federated models. These, in principles, are uh, in principle these principles are are not really absolutely new, but they have to deal with what I call much more massive information that becomes a bit uh, available. Granularity comes down to the fraction of millimeters and uh, information goes not only on top of the landscape, but it's uh, in the landscape and it's uh, in the, in the uh, ground below the landscape. In urban uh, terms, all the pipes and uh, 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 things uh, below the surface of the urban infrastructure is absolutely important, together with all their functional water pipes, uh, uh, sewage uh, 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 systems, and so on, uh, metro systems, uh, underground tunnels uh, for transport and, and everything, to have these things with at least the same high level uh, digital um, principles of uh, what we did on top of the ground with the 3D, typical 3D models. That is uh, something which is a challenge it's, uh, also so for the future, but not only challenges, but of course also perspective of doing much more uh, 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 of organizing our uh, common space in the city. Here in uh, we, we, we have to organize these massive data um, and, and uh, uh, active data streams which come from censoring certain aspects in all these system. Uh, we have to organize this in data spaces and uh, I just give you an overview of the uh, recent uh, data spaces that the European Union is working in. And that is from manuf manufacturing to Green Deal, mobility, health, financial energy, and so on. Um, and on the on the right of the slide, you see smart communities uh, also uh, mentioned for uh, our action space. So this is an open system where, of course, much more uh, other spaces can be can be uh, joined. And uh, but but here is a, a lot of activity going, especially in mobility. The, the third uh, entry from the left, um, mobility is, uh, as I said, uh, of absolute priority at the moment. And uh, you see all the kind of industrial ecosystems that deal with that is from construction, tourism, textile, proximity, um, automotive, health, and so on. And uh, that is uh, what what we don't have, actually. We may discuss that later. We don't have real good means how to deal with that complexity of information. The ontology of the urban digital twins, that is kind of the, the, uh, common conceptualization and the digital um, uh, 
semantic models and procedural models, what we are dealing with, that uh, starts with uh, terms, properties, identity, status, annotations, role, causalities, the, the semantic ne networks, what is more or less known uh, as a principle. And uh, nevertheless, we, we have to de do much more with procedural networks because there is action in the digital twins. They are the, the, the most challenging difference is that we don't have only static facts, but as I said uh, previously, uh, all these things are uh, uh, on the fly with uh, sensors all around, uh, information streams coming from every side, and the whole thing is not just for presentation, full stop, then you have the presentation, anyone else can take it, the, the presentation, but now the whole system is for direct steering the city. I'm not favoring a direct robot uh, working uh, behind that, nevertheless, for traffic management, uh, traffic light management, uh, traffic uh, optimization or something, uh, there is a lot of interactive uh, connection to this, uh, to, to physical and uh, digital, <laughs> between physical and digital, um, but uh, not in all cases uh, that would be possible. But for the, to, for handling this, we need procedural networks. That doesn't have uh, happen just by chance. We have, but we have to do a model, uh, uh, models and discuss the models of this. And the ontologies that we set up uh, would have as ontologies, on the ontology level, uh, capabilities of comparison, different ontologies uh, through uh, globally and through different cities, because at the, mo at the moment, uh, a lot of different proposals for, for having ontology of, of uh, urban cities is on the table. There's not yet a real uh, international uh, standard for it. Uh, we have to compare these ontologies. We have to do that automatically because it's so complicated systems. Data management, that, that, imagine, imagine a data management plan for the whole digital uh, urban twin. And uh, so that, that is uh, rather complex. And for comparison, we need that automatism to do it. Uh, we have to, to, to the function of union of ontologies. We have different subdomains, which we model first, and then we have to merge these to get to a more complete holistic aspect of ontologies of uh, the, uh, digital twins. We have to do generalization in the ontologies because we have to deal with uh, technical uh, detailed structures, and we have to, uh, to support uh, upper management um, in the city doing for decision support on very different organizational levels uh, in the city. Coherence analysis, that uh, is uh, the question of, is that ontology and the details um, uh, of data stored coherent with legal boundary conditions, with financial boundary conditions, with ethic boundary conditions, and so on. So this list is excuse large. Me, uh, there is discussion in detail for this, but uh, we don't have the time at the moment. <laughs> One minute. We have to homogenize uh, the terminology. We do work on the on the formats and meta information. Nevertheless, the most important thing for the future would be a new the standardized workflows for uh, standard operating procedures in this big uh, information flow. We uh, at the same time for doing this logistics just in time. We need to do something not just right just in time, but we have to implement just in time. This implementing just in time is a thing that we also have not very good experiences at the moment. Uh, behavior models, um, the challenges, I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, beside cloud computing, you see that, that is, that is uh, uh, all things that is discussed, but also in the end, uh, you see also my hint to implementing just-in-time demands. This is absolutely new science needed behind that. Recommendation of action is uh, we have to record, work with scenarios, 
complex work on complexity management, we have absolute deficits in doing models of complexity management. Sorry, uh, but we have to, to that is really urgent uh, that we do about it. And for the full management, you see also the entry on the right side audits uh, to have independent control of uh, plans, implementations, and does it work? Does it have the effect? Does it reach the goal or what is uh, um, planned for? Thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward for the discussion. And here you have the download link of the presentation. I have more material for those who are interested in uh, digital, digital twins. I am very happy to have a direct contact uh, later. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our fifth speaker is Professor Ricardo from Mexico. His topic is on challenges and uh, commitments in digital technology and the sustainable environment according to the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. Let's welcome Professor Ricardo from Mexico. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank to Dr. Liu, Dr. Chao, Dr. Tomoto, and I'd like to say hello to Ki Gong and Dr. Dr. Horst. Well, I would like to talk about the challenge and commitments in digital technology and sustainable environment according to the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement that is called USMCA. First, I would like to show how the legal framework is formed in Mexico since it's important to efficiently address the issue of challenge in the green and digital transitions towards uh, to a sustainable future. In general terms, our Mexican constitution stands as the highest legal system followed by the international treaties, federal laws, and local leg legislation along with the official Mexican regulations. In human rights, both our constitution and international treaties occupy a place of equal importance ensuring the protection and promoting of human rights in accordance with pro-person principles. Within our Constitution, Article 4 expressly recognizes that every person has a right to an environment adequate for their development and well-being. This underlines the relevance of environmental sustainability on our fundamental legislation. At the international level, Mexico has signed 62 international instruments on environmental matters, including notable events such as the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm and the United Nations Conference on Environment Development in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Among the most important treaties, US, USMCA seeks to establish a framework framework for economic and commercial cooperation between the three neighboring nations. Although the USMCA does not address specifically the use of digital technology in the environmental sustainability, it is undeniable that these two areas are crucial to the future of our societies and economies. Chapter 24 of the USMCA focuses on the environment and establishes goal to promote the protection and sustainable management of natural resources. This includes a commitment to create and effectively enforce environmental laws and comply with the international environmental agreements to which we are a party. Although the agreement addresses uses concerning digital technology, e-commerce and data protection, it is important to consider specific technological aspects with application in the environment. Harmonizing regulation and policies around these issues is a crucial challenge. Regarding the Mexican national legal framework, the environmental law, which is called, called in Spanish, Ley General de Equilibrio Ecológico y Protección al Medio Ambiente, in Article 5 promotes the application of technologies, equipment, and process that reduce pollution and promote scientists, scientific and so technological research in favor of environment. 
As I mentioned, at IEF 2021, authorities and civil sector should consider using big data to generate and use cleaning and renewable energy. And the question is, what can we say about the use of artificial intelligence that is discussing during the current IEF in Kyoto? Well, well, I think this is important to know its operation and applicability to protect the environment. Nowadays, the demand of sustainable and efficient electrical energy is an unavoidable priority. In this context, AI emerged as transformative tool that can revolutionize the generation and management of renewable energy. AI, through big data analysis and autonomous decision making, can improve the efficiency and reliability sorry, of renewable energy sources such as solar and wind. As we can see, we have a solid legal framework to address the green and digital transitions towards a sustainable future. However, we need more. In addition, it is essential that authorities join together and collaborate closely with private business corporations, civil society, and academia to achieve the national and international levels. Moreover, with the support and advice of world experts like my colleagues in this workshop, we can, on one hand, learn, learn for their experience, and on the other hand, exchange ideas and strategies to build a green and sustainable world with the support of the technologies. Only by working together, we can take full advantage of these political and legal instruments and build a sustainable and equitable future, future for all. In addition to above, some of the challenge where technological strategies must be implemented are reduce greenhouse gas emission and in all economic sectors, promoting, promoting the adoption of more clean technologies as sustainable practices. Second, to continue with regional and global cooperation and investing in digital infrastructure, thus facilitating the transition to a digital and sustainable economy. Third, ensure equity and social justice in the transition through training and skills development so that communities affected by changes in the, in the industry can fully participate in the digital and green economy. And final, continue working on the harmonization of standards and norms related to technology and the environment, environment between the three countries, thus facilitating trade and cooperation in areas crucial to the sustainable future of North America. Thank you very much for the invitation again. Thank you, Professor Ricardo. Maybe there is a technical problem. Uh, so our sixth uh, presentation, the, the, the presenter is uh, offline for the time being. So we move to uh, open discussion. First of all, I have three questions for our expert. After that, let's see any on-site or online participant have some questions or comments. Uh, there's three questions. So the first question focuses on key challenges and government issues. The second focuses on strengthening the cooperation among multiple stakeholders. And the third uh, focuses on policy framework, policy guidelines, uh, regulations, something like this. So I hope uh, our expert select maybe one, two, three, or please. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Liu. I think challenging is uh, uh, 
their uh, how to make the weak people uh, developing countries at least uh, and uh, uh, especially for the mountain areas, uh, small islands, countryside, villages, they're so weak people. We need to call all communities, government, international organizations, pay more attention to these people. These people need the help. They really need this uh, hungry free, poverty reduction for disaster you know, sale. So I think the challenging is how we can pay more attention to these people. Not only cities, not, not only rich people. So this, from my experience working with these guys, these people, I pay more attention to this. I think the challenging is science, technology, ICTs, everything, commercial issues, whether we can work together in the best way for them. This is my, uh, my opinion, my experience. Yes. Thank you, Professor Liu. Professor Ricardo? Well, I would like to ask the same question. And I'm going to talk about the law uh, point of view. And as I say, it's important that the authorities get actively involved in the international forums such like this, the IGF. In fact, I am especially happy because some Mexican parliamentaries, parliamentarians, sorry, who are interested in the internet governance issues attended this, this IGF in Kyoto. Without any doubt, this is a great start. Now it's important that they do an excellent job in materializing the creation of laws and their due promotion to achieve the goal of taking advantage of the digital and green transitions for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Tomoko? Okay, um, about the question A, the challenges, I would like to give my opinion to uh, probably the developing countries and industrialized countries' situations are completely different. But uh, how I feel now is, for example, the government officers, scientists, and the private sectors, there are many people who work on those issues uh, very seriously. However, they tend to work uh, independently. In a way, I feel they work uh, separately in isolation sometimes. In that case, what I feel is some people or organization who can bond these people are lacking. So the people or organizations who could function like bridge or bond uh, will be necessary for future as a challenge in my understanding. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Kremers. Yeah, I, I think uh, on governance issues um, is something where in science we lag behind. There is a lot of lot of new methodology, not only develop existing metho methodology, but new methodology needed for complexity and uh, processes. And, uh, uh, but science is not working alone. Uh, as also other speakers, I'm very, very uh, I'm also interested uh, to, to, uh, to learn more from uh, Ricardo uh, experiences in Mexico. Um, we are, have to deal with the administrations, people, and I say they are, as I know here from Germany, for big data and complex data, administrations are not so really well equipped. And uh, sometimes it's an educational uh, setting also needed. 
So how do we need the, the uh, uh, needed uh, competencies? Because after science experience and uh, it works, the whole thing normally goes into administration for operational long-term uh, uh, systems running for the service of citizens. That is not only a scientific part. And this kind of uh, governance needed to set these up in a participative mode, as Ricardo also said, we, uh, not, not only with the government, but also with citizens. Citizens are not general citizens. There are engineers, there are doctors, there are health-specific uh, uh, agencies, and, and so on, in the service of people. These kind of actors need to uh, discuss with that, with, with us, and um, um, that, is, that is what we need to, to support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please close this one, the presentation. Yeah. So, uh, to answer participation, participation, do you have any questions or uh, or comments to, for our four speakers today. Please. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. My name is Tarek Hassan. I'm the head of the Digital Transformation Center Vietnam, uh, working on behalf of the Federal German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, GIZ Vietnam. Um, my question is to Tomoko-san. I was very inspired by the work you do, since we also focus on facilitating the green and digital trend transition, I was wondering more on the ministry collaboration because I think you mentioned two ministries, the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Rural Development or some sort of ministry focus on biodiversity. Sorry that I don't have this name um, in my, on the top of my head, but I was wondering uh, what the division of labor is also with the role of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications so is this more within the sort of jurisdiction of the Ministry um, of Environment? Uh, is also the Ministry of uh, Inform Internal Affairs and Communications of Japan also working on biodiversity issues? I think this bounces back to the question of do the green folks work on digital or do the digital folks work on green and what are the sort of collaboration mechanisms surrounding that? Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. Uh, maybe I can show my PowerPoint again. Zuei, could you show my PowerPoint? PowerPoint, please. Around the page nine. Page nine. Okay. Uh, the two minister ministries uh, you are talking is first Ministry of Environment. That's called MOE in English, in short. Another one is Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. In short, we call it MAFF, M-A-F-F. Uh, page nine, please. Uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, what's the different function of these two ministries? Uh, MOE is, uh, for example, uh, what I introduced this law, um, the Wildlife Protection Control and Hunting Management Act that was uh, proposed and revised by the, under the authority of the Ministry of Environment. And what the, is another uh, ministry MAF is doing is they are in charge of agriculture. And uh, but they have the land, for example, if their land belongs to the government, we call it national forest. They are in charge of national forest too. So MOE and MAF have a lot of overlapping uh, issues, especially about this shikadia and wild boars population control. They need to collaborate. Uh, due to the time constraints, I did not introduce very much in detail, but uh, Basically, uh, the, there are the consultation between two ministries. The introduction I did about this new goal, uh, new goal was set up together by two ministries. 
So this is a common goal uh, by two ministries and also common goal of Japanese government too. And uh, also inside, how say, under the ministry, there are the prefectures. And under the prefectures, there are the cities and the villages too in Japan. So how to collaborate is, I did not explain very much, but in this figure, uh, red color means country's work, and blue color means uh, prefecture's work. So they, com they work together in some domain, like I mentioned the second component, uh, control of capturing wildlife. Government should do something, and the prefecture should do something together. But uh, some work is divided uh, uh, independently too. Um, yeah, so basically a country uh, prepares uh, I'll say basic guideline and law. And under that, uh, prefectures uh, do the practical programs. The implementation of the programs will be done by prefectures. That is uh, how they collaborate each other. Did I answer your question? The question that for us is really interesting is how do you build up capacity within the ministries? Because you mentioned like IoT devices that are being uh, deployed. So is that technical capacity for oh. digital transformation you build within the ministries? Is that something that you outsource? Do you work together with the digital ministry? Or does the digital ministry actually have a role uh, in that? Um. Mm, in my understanding, the, the, there is an agency of uh, digital uh, ministry was newly uh, developed inside of uh, cabinet, but uh, they are in charge of uh, uh, issues about, for example, the number identification of uh, human, for example, and uh, not uh, doing, uh, how say, this kind of work very much. The ICT techniques and technologies I mentioned and introduced today were proposed by private sectors. And so what, is, uh, what we are doing is uh, from the top level, high level, uh, Ministry of Environment and MAF collaborated together to set up a goal as a government. And uh, for necessity, uh, they sometimes need to change the revised uh, act. And based on this revision, private sectors and prefectures start to work on it. I belong to private sector, so I, am a, I got the certification of implemented, implementer of this program. So prefecture develop a program and uh, we are implementing this program. So like that kind of uh, collaboration is occurring in Japan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any more questions on site? Mm, please. Yeah, we talk about the twin uh, transition. So what kind of data could be accepted? For example, how do we know the data is good data or poor data we are using? To Professor Liu. <laughs> Please, thank you very much. Yeah, good question. So there's uh, big data uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the society now. A bunch of bunch of data comes, but how to identify which data is trustable? Which data is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is good, can be used for your research or for your uh, business? So this is uh, really challenging. Uh, a good question, thank you. And then, uh, in, you know, there are for the data divided to different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, sources, uh, some data from government, uh, some from private sectors, and some from the research, uh, university uh, research uh, sectors. So this is, uh, 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 there are different policies, and then uh, how open there. And uh, for, for research part, uh, for most of the research part, I'm from Chinese Academy of Sciences. 
there are in in the whole world we have a uh, uh, there are uh, world data system. Uh, what this system is under the International Science Council. There are uh, mm, totally there are 86 world data centers uh, in the system. So that's, uh, there is a peer review for the data set for peer review because all the data come from research part. Different scientists, uh, there are different ideas, uh, different methodologies, and different results. So how to make sure this? There we, ca we, we should control the one is uh, whose data. So, so who's author of the data? So there's a, we need to protect uh, original authors where the data come from. And then where the data, how the data produced, in which model, in which methodology, uh, in the way this, you need to have a, a curation about the data. And second one, we need to check, uh, check, check what check it is, uh, uh, data security. Uh, Different uh, different uh, uh, policy, different uh, countries, different uh, uh, organizations. Whether this is uh, uh, private uh, or personal uh, security, business uh, security, and so on, we need to check this. And then we need to check the security and then the, the ch check the, the quality, data quality. So how do data quality for the, for geographer? We are, I'm geographer, so geographer they are different for the table. Uh, test and uh, and uh, then the uh, raster, uh, geolocation, different resolution, and it's very very com complicated. But we need the uh, experts, uh, experts to review this kind of data. So ch so there is a we got our data center is a global change research data publishing and the repository. We through the publishing uh, the the methodology and the per review go data and the data could be very uh, 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 trustable. So we call this trustable. So I call you, and uh, um, if you have data, you go to the World Data Center system. That, that data is, there is an international uh, regulation, and put them, make this uh, trustable. Thank you. Thank you. Because our sixth uh, presenter now is online. Professor Daisy, are you here? Professor Daisy, are you here? Yes, why? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. you you have only seven minutes. Can you share your presentation? <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, this is the South Africa. Uh, she is a uh, uh, very, uh, very good uh, uh, expert in the information uh, management. Uh, and uh, she also is uh, uh, joined the International Association for Science uh, and the Technology in the code in the code data. And also uh, is uh, working uh, with us then the many years for the developing countries, share the data in developing countries. I think the I had Daisy, are you online? Yes, the internet is a challenge where I okay, am. Okay, go, yes. go ahead, please. For opening up. Yes, let me go ahead. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, colleagues. What we want to highlight with you is how we actually look at open access repositories as an accelerator and enhancing our South African SDG hub. And these are all the 17 SDGs that we are all aware of. So I just want to move quickly based on the time that uh, we are aware that the African leaders have responded to the SDG agenda by setting the regional priorities based on the common African position. And in post to that, we also looked at the African Union Agenda 2063. And this is what highlights us for sustainability issues. 
And the African Union agenda places uh, prominence on research and innovation for sustainable development. An important development is the formulation of the SDGs with the universal recognition of the importance of quality education, especially in the Global South, which is on goal four. And when we look at the goal four targets of particular relevance to us who are in knowledge management and knowledge production, we look at repositories, data stewards, libraries and information specialists, which is aligned to goal three, which is how to ensure the livelihood and the well-being of our, in, of our population. So how do we come in from where we are with what we want to do regarding sustainable development and sustainability? We look at uh, goal three and then goal four, and a goal four on education targets the issues around who are the actual role players, especially those who are involved in knowledge production and who bears the responsibility on the complex and interrelated issues of accessibility and afford affordability of knowledge resources. And I just want to indicate that uh, knowledge management uh, and its impact on SDGs is highlighted within the four areas we are looking at availability, accessibility, accept uh, acceptability, and adaptability. And here we're looking at uh, how do we actually facilitate sharing of information, accessibility, the roles that information literacy programs play, and acceptability, making available open source academic journals, because if you want to address the SDGs, we need to be looking at all these things. The other aspect is the issue of adaptability. And here, well, how do we consider the training of researchers, policymakers, citizen science, and public outreach support to ensure the application of knowledge involving in solving the key global disaster health problems. And I would just want to indicate that we have uh, the indicators that are key to us in the global south and especially in Southern Africa where we are. We look at the amount of uh, research and development uh, spent around the gross domestic product, which we spend 50% of our annual investment is in research and development performed in South Africa comes from international partners. We also look at the indicator on qualitative measurement of use and access to ICTs. And especially now we're looking at the fourth industrial revolution. Also the ability to produce high export technology and also the issue around higher education internal internationalization because we know that our scientists and researchers and our postgraduate students, they are international and they uh, co-publish and so forth. And like what we are doing today, we are co-presenting. And also we look at the indicators on the number of scientists the country produces and the number of patents that are filed in our country. And what's important also is the number or the impact of articles published in, in highly ranked journals. And these are the indicators that are highlighted. And quickly, the influences of our indicators, especially in Southern Africa, is the issues around uh, government's uh, strategies on national research development strategy, the higher plan for education, for example, the plan for science, technology, engineering, maths, which is the 10-year innovation plan from our Ministry of Science and Innovation. And we also have our South African Open Science Draft Policy that's also assisting us. So I'm just, I will now leave to my colleague, uh, Lazarus, to touch base on how do we support the uh, knowledge for sustainable development and how do we capture uh, the SDGs. Lazarus, you can come in. Morning, colleagues. Um, I'm just going to touch quickly because of time uh, on some of the things that we are doing. Uh, so in South Africa, through the National Advisory Council, our strategy is to support um, um, uh, repositories. As you can see here, working with uh, universities, research councils, national facilities, institutions, museums, and others. So these are basically where we are trying to ensure that they fall within the institutional policies that they are, 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 are prioritizing to ensure that they can uh, generate um, content that they are producing and, and, and link it into all the repositories that we can push. So in terms of um, um, this, there are the, the two policies, which uh, the first one is research outputs, um, which each and every university um, uh, produces. And then the second one is the creative outputs. This could be your film arts, uh, visual arts, music, theater, design, etc. So what we have so far tried is to ensure that 
all the universities have a repository, both for publications and data. And also uh, through the University of Pretoria, there has been a project we, where we have developed the South African SDG Hub to harvest all the collections that are in, within the universities. Um, this also has to be the issue that days raised that we need to train our librarians to be able to index some of this content to ensure that they fall within the SDG um, uh, criteria and uh, through a taxonomy, a national taxonomy uh, that is also supported by the national development agenda of the country. So if we look, um, I'm not gonna touch much. There is, uh, so the leverage is for open access is through these, um, the library experts that we are also um, capacitating within the repository fields and, and to ensure that, you know, the, the repositories also fall within the best practices uh, around the world. And so we work with other organizations, uh, with uh, colleagues in and CUA and other organizations where we learn uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, the skills that are required. Then we pass it on to our uh, community of practice here in South Africa. So um, one of the elements that we have also pushed is to ensure that each university is an open journal system and, 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 and also they have a choice, but most of uh, the, organized, the universities are using this space as a software. And through this space, we are able to collaborate to fix problems that can um, happen and, 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 and et cetera. So these are the, the, some of the repositories that are in the institutions. And, um, and, 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 and also you can see the, the data repositories that have been created so far from some of the research intensive universities and also the, the OJS system. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thanks. Professor Daisy and uh, Mr. Lazarus, I'm right? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, I think I, uh, Professor Zhou is a remote moderator, so whether there is any questions from or comments from online. Professor Zhou. Yes, Professor Tao. Yeah, one I question. think uh, I uh, had a few questions online, but uh, due to time restriction, uh, I'm not sure if uh, our speaker can respond to all the questions. There is a, a question from the Andrei Khrushchev from uh, Common Funds for Commodities. Uh, he indicated global commodity value chain is very complex. Could the speaker speculate how technology could support their green transition, food security, energy efficiency? Uh, I think also uh, host raised his hand. Uh, I don't know if he has any response or any question. Uh, I pass the uh, floor to the on-site chair. Professor, I'll talk to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, just a short remark, because such questions are unusual in our normal working groups. There are professions around, like uh, as Andre represents, which would be needed to, to join the whole thing for all these consequences of what we are doing, not just collecting data. Uh, we are doing these processes for certain purposes. And uh, as Andre said, uh, uh, that uh, for green transition for food security, energy efficiency, and so on, transport efficiency, all these data spaces that I mentioned in my view graphs, they, they come together and we have to find out how to, how to put them together. There are models in food security, there are models in energy efficiency. In the other, other view graphs, I said, we have to join these ontologies. Uh, this is a problem for itself and I hope to stay in contact for doing more in that area. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Due to our need Okay, to I time. think uh, there is uh, no more uh, question uh, right now. Because I of think, the, uh, the time uh, limit. <laughs> okay. 
Yes. Okay. I think you, our site uh, can have. Uh, okay, thank you, Professor continue. Joe. Due to mm. our limited time today and uh, all of the speakers presented many excellent points of view, I might need many, maybe another one or two hours to conclude. So this is the end of this workshop. And uh, we want to extend our most profound appreciation to all the experts for their expansional presentations, to both on-site and online participants for their insightful questions, and of course, to organizers who, whose dedication and tireless effort make this workshop a success. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to call all of you to come here. We get together to take a picture. OK? Very good. Good. <laughs> come on. So maybe we uh, know to each other, and the next, next year we can meet again. Thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to give my regards, special regards to Liu Chuang, for we worked together now more than 20 years in these topics. and. Uh, uh, hope we can do so for the future. Thank you.